You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G, a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, everyone. I'm sitting here in the Black Like Me studios. Welcome to another podcast episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. For the entire month of June, I'm highlighting the beauty of fatherhood, the highs and the excitement of fatherhood. And so I have an exciting guest with me today. But before I get into that, let me just say I want to thank all the listeners around the world who continue to listen to our podcast. We are way beyond the 5,000 unique downloads. Uh, My friends in Japan, your downloads have doubled in the last week. So thank you. Whoever is out there helping us spread the word, I appreciate you. And please keep spreading the word. But for others in the other 14 countries, thank you so much for listening. UK, you are really blowing up. I appreciate that. Folks and friends in Ireland, thank you for continuing to download. So as I promised you, each segment, we have exciting guests. And today's guest is one of my favorite people on the planet. And we're going to be talking about the beauty of of, uh, fatherhood. So my guest in the studio today is Catherine Alexis Victorious G, better known as Lexi G. And she is my daughter. Uh, Jackie and I have one child. Lexi is it. And um, and we're in the studios having a conversation. S- you know, some of the things about fatherhood, uh, others just about life. She gets to, you know, she's on the record today, so she can call me out on a couple of things. But uh, Lexi hails from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, she's a recent graduate from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, with a degree in creative writing with a certificate in Italian. Um, this young lady is fluent in Italian and Spanish, and um, probably has the highest GPA in our family. Both her mom (laughs) and I have degrees from Wisconsin, but Lexi definitely has won uh, the GPA contest. And we're going to be having a conversation because I just thought if I were listening to a podcast, I would love to hear dad and daughter talk about the relationship or about life or about the world. And so, Lexi G, welcome to Black Like Me. Welcome to Black Like Us. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, I know I know you're a little nervous, but are, are you all right? You got your water and everything? I'm good. I'm very nervous, but I'm good. No, no. This is Thank you for agreeing to do this. And um in part this is my Father's Day gift, right? I mean, that's that's how my that's how my podcast manager that's how he approached you with it. Like, yeah. hey, you could do this for your dad's Father's Day gift because we know you did not want to do this. <laughs> so, I'm glad that you're here. Hey, one of the things that we do to sort of just release the tension is that I do something that's called a black ice breaker. <laughs> and um but I think you're the youngest guest I've had. Okay. And so this is a millennial oh, black good. ice breaker. <laughs> so just a little check in. And so <clears throat> just a couple of questions so we can just sort of laugh and talk. Um Lexi, are you old enough to remember Penny Proud? Who? What? Pen- Oh, the, yes. The Proud Family. The, the Proud TV fa- show. The TV show. Yeah. Now, was that the only black cartoon characters that you can remember while growing up? Uh, was it the only black cartoon family? There was Little Bill on Nickelodeon. I forgot about Little Bill. Yeah. But I think those are the only two I can think of. Penny. Oh, and what was Penny's grandmother called? Uh, Sugar Mama. <laughs> Sugar Mama. Okay. Got you. Got you. Um, Which of the Teletubbies was African American? <laughs> All of them. All of them. All of them. What were their names? Uh, I cannot remember. I'll start you off. Then you got to finish. Tinky Winky. Um. Oh, what's the Dipsy. One? Lala, and Poe. Poe. Poe kind of sounded black to me though. Poe. <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not saying poor. No, I'm just saying <laughs> Tinky Winky. That ain't black. No, that is kind of black. I can imagine Dipsy. No, Lala. Yeah, Lala, that's yes. black. Paul, that's, that's, that's hood. That's right, Paul. And uh, <laughs> um, did you watch Barney as a kid? I did. Okay, was Barney from the hood? Absolutely, gotcha. without a doubt. Uh, did Barney ever rap? <laughs> oh um, I can only hope so. <laughs> did you ever want to be on Barney? I was kind of scared of him. Okay, were there black kids on Barney? Probably. I'm trying to I remember. I think so. It was okay. pretty diverse really well like, okay because black kids don't do dragons so i know i was just curious he's a dinosaur that. so he's a different. dinosaur okay so black kids a, do dinosaurs gotcha so that's a dragon it okay so <laughs> dragon's a dinosaur sword that breeds fire yeah i guess okay sort of. all right i got you um do do you when you were growing up did your grandparents put plastic on furniture 
Um, I don't know. I don't know if Grandma did. I don't think so. No, Grandma didn't. She was but too cool for that. I'm aware of it. You're aware of it? You saw it? I've you saw seen it. it. You saw it where? Uncle in, Connie's house? Yeah. In Chicago? Yeah. What did you think when you first saw plastic on the front of you? Did you understand it? Definitely not. I think I was confused as to like why my legs would stick to it. <laughs> and and because, you know, in the showroom, they used to have plastic on it. And so it's kind of like folks who wouldn't take the tags off their baseball cap. <laughs> so it looked like it was stolen from a showroom or something like that. <laughs> that's Okay, that's interesting. When you were growing up, Way back when, did you have to be on the front porch by the time the street lights came on? I did not. <laughs> did you have a front porch? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, were schools segregated when you were a kid? Yes. Okay, that's because you, you grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> and so that, 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 ding, 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 you are true, man. Yeah, you are right. Okay. Hey, grits or cream of wheat? Grits. Okay, now butter's a given. Salt or sugar? Now, oh. be careful. Answer, because your mom's here. She's from Alabama. <laughs> She's a salt woman. I'm from Chicago. I'm a sugar man. Sugar or salt? What did you? What was your answer? Both. That's your final answer. Final answer. Wait, wait. At the same time? Yeah, both. Which do you put more on? More of on? Uh. So is the salt just to just to season it, but the sugar gives it flavor. I mean, I like I, I like the sweet and salty. So okay, that's you know that's a good answer. Okay, I like I like that. Um. Has a white person ever felt your hair without asking your permission? <laughs> yes. Wow. Really? Okay. Welcome. All right. Welcome to the cl- welcome to the club. I actually and, just found a poem about that. Did you really? And where were you at school? Were you at work? I was at work. So a person just walked. Was she like your age? No. Like she's in her like forties, maybe. And just like, put and just put her hands in your hair. Yeah. Wow. What did What did she say? Is it real? Can I? T- is it- <laughs> She said, uh, how do you get your hair like this? <laughs> and you said, the real question is, how do I get your hands like <laughs> this? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. And it's, and, okay. So you, you told her. Wow. That's okay. That's interesting. And then did you tell her not to put her hands in your hair? Yeah. I, okay. I did have to say that to a grown right. woman. Now, have you ever eaten toast that was not made in a toaster? Yes, I prefer it that way. <laughs> <laughs> now, now when we're growing up. We used to have like these sleepovers and things. You, well, you had these sleepovers with your friends. Yeah, many of them were white. They would never had so. So, if you don't make toaster in a toast, where do you in toaster? If you don't make toast in a toaster, where do you make it? In the oven. Under the broiler. Okay, right. so your friends had like never had it. <laughs> so they came over. They wanted a snack. Your mom made. You know, you take this white Wonder Bread. You butter it. You put it under the broiler. These kids thought they died and went to heaven. Like, oh my, <laughs> oh my. They went home and tried to tell their parents. Like, yeah. you got to cook toast in yeah, the oven. Yeah, one of them told me they tried to do it at home. And their mom was like, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't put bread Why in. are you putting bread in the oven? Tyler, have you ever had bread in the oven? Toast in the oven? Only from you. Oh my gosh. Eli, when you were growing up, did you ever make, did you ever eat toast made under the broiler? Um, not especially, just like garlic bread or something. <laughs> 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 I love that garlic bread. <laughs> oh my! And I don't know. Maybe it's because when I was a kid, we didn't have toasters. But um, I hated toasters growing up because you couldn't butter. I used to still do it when we grew up. And when I was growing up, and we did finally get a toaster, I would butter it and still put it in the toaster. And I'd get in trouble for that mm-hmm. because it was just like melt all in it and everything. But I only saw toast being made under the under the broiler. So toaster freaked me out. But well, it's anyway. That was just really funny because one, your friends fell in love with it. Well, we didn't get a toaster until I was in high school. <laughs> Oh, because we used to make, that's right. Because yeah. you used to cook your um, Pop-Tarts and, uh, yeah. and your Eggos. Yeah. We didn't have enough counter space. I wanted one, but your mom didn't want it. Um, <laughs> um, do not look at your mother. Who spanked you the most growing up? Your mom, your grandmother, or your dad? <laughs> and I've already checked social workers. This is beyond the statute of limitations. And so whoever it is, because it's been probably more than um, 15 years, you can't do anything <laughs> to us. Who spanked you the most? Well, it's definitely not you. Okay, that's all you needed to say, honey. That's right. That's all. Good answer. Good answer. Hey, what message do you think Beyonce was given during her formation video? What do I think she the was halftime? giving? What, what was the message do you think that she was conveying at that Super Bowl? I think it was very pro-black woman. And I think it was really interesting because that was the one where she was with Bruno Mars, right? Right, right, right. So it was kind of funny because you can see the the guy from Coldplay just kind of like disappear <laughs> and, they, and they just like take up all of the space off, yeah, yeah. yeah um but yeah i think it was very pro-black women it was very um it was not at all what i expected mm-hmm. um, i don't think it's what the nfl expected 
I don't think it's what America expected. Oh, remember some of the memes when some of the white women were saying, it's not for us. <laughs> <laughs> they were showing playing that. They're like, what are those Afro puffs? This Beyonce's music is not for us. And of course it is. But, you know, so many things are going on. She used that. And right. so I, just, I said that because I just remember that being really important yes. to you as a young African-American woman, just yes. looking at someone taking, you know, s- such a powerful stance about, about the need to, you know, highlight the strengths of our, of our community and, and our history. Oh my goodness! Can you can you ask Lexi a question? Yeah. Okay, we got. I'm scared. Were you flaming hot Cheetos or Takis? Takis. What's a Taki? <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like a Cheeto, but it's. Um, it's like lime. Yeah. Spicy lime. Yeah. Oh, they're good. Does it hurt when you eat it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're good though. They're really good. No, you're doing really great. Okay, just one last question. How long have I been your dad? Long enough. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> just wanted just to check in on that. So I just mentioned that that you so that you know that you just finished college. So what are what are you doing these days? What are you what are you up to? Um, like the summer. Or yes, like in the, the summer, future? and then you know what are you doing after college? So uh, what are you, what are you up to this summer? Working, yeah, so, hanging out at the beach, at the pool. <laughs> what are you What are you up to? Um, yeah, I'm mostly working this summer, trying to see my friends that are back in town. Sure, that's 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 fun to do. And, yeah. and you're also starting to, to think about grad school, something you're mm-hmm. thinking about doing maybe a year or so down the road. What yeah. what area are you interested in, in pursuing? I'm looking into library sciences. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, that's that is that's very exciting. We're really proud of you too, honey. I know I mess with you and I may not say it often enough. No, I say it all the time. I'm really, really <laughs> proud of you. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about childhood, a little bit about adulthood. And so so hopefully that millennial black icebreaker helped her just relax you. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, fatherhood is really important to me. I, I've written about it. It's part of my dissertation. It's part of what I preach about. It's part of my programming. And so, you know, that your mother and I made a big deal out of, you know, your deal over, you know, you're coming into the world due to our previous losses because we lost mm-hmm. um, we lost two daughters who, who died after premature birth. You know, you had these big birthday parties and these sleepovers. Um, when do you think you caught on um, to the fact that um, your life, your birth, your you know, that 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 was a big deal or special meaning to me as a dad? Um. To you specifically? Mm-hmm. To me specifically. I think I'm constantly still learning. Um, I th- like I think I don't think that that's a one time thing. I think that, that makes sense. as I get older and as our relationship changes, I think um, I'm I get to know you differently, and so I think that that forces me to kind of look back sure. at my childhood and kind of realize like. Um, how like certain moments were really significant. Like I think a lot about um, when I was little and you would take me and Allie and Christian and push us on that. Well, Christian couldn't go on the tire swing, but you would push <laughs> he me. Would get, he, would get, he would get sick. He would get sick. What a little wimp. <laughs> but you would push me and Allie on the tire swing um, or you would just like drive around with me in my car seat, even though I would kick the back of you. <laughs> I hate it when you did that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I think I, I kind of look back on things that don't, necessarily seem like groundbreaking but we're definitely still significant wow no that's that's great you i think um fatherhood was always such an important thing to me and it grew out of not having my father um and being raised part of my life by stepfather i don't even want to yeah that's all i need to say about that Mm -hmm. not really raised but he was he was there he was he was around kind of um but that was a dark and damaging time of our of our family's life but Mm -hmm. Um, but being a dad was going to be a lot of was going to be a lot of fun. So I really, really uh, look forward to that. What people might not realize is your birth really scared us because because your mom and I lost two daughters prior to you. They, they were live births, but just really, really premature. So when you came into the world 16 weeks early, I mean, your mom was just at 24 weeks. And so you were born in Dece- on December 2nd. You weren't due until the middle of March. And so you were a pound and a half in this, you know, in this incubator. Those are really, really scary days. And so there were times we didn't even know if we were gonna if we were gonna bring you home. I think by the time you were two weeks old, I'd only held you twice. I had um a speaking engagement at an ev- event called Urbana, it's Urbana ninety six in um Champaign Urbana, Illinois. There were like twenty thousand students gathered. I was one of the last speakers on the closing night for the communion service. And I said, I'm not going, I'm not going. Because, you know, you're only like three weeks old and I didn't know what your state was gonna be when I got back. And uh, your mom encouraged me 
to go. There are people who are in the audience who have seen pictures of you on you know my Facebook page as a graduate, and they just shake their heads and say, I remember praying for that little girl because I put a picture of you up on the screen in an incubator in front of these 18,000 people. And they were yelling out in the crowd, let's pray for Lexi, let's pray for Lexi. And so it's interesting, you come into this world not understanding that there's so much anticipation and so much hope and um, and so many prayers going on around you. I know sometimes that can probably feel like Pressure. I mean, people look at you and just think, hey, she's an accomplished young lady. But I just want to acknowledge being the child of a community activist and leader and pastor and, and, and author and public figure. Um, you've had to share me a lot with the world and you've done such a good job of that. So one, I just want to let you know that um, that I appreciate that. But as you're growing up, did you know that you were sharing me with the world? Like, did you under, did you know that sometimes we could plan something? I get a call that there's an emergency. Someone died. Someone went to the hospital and we'd have to sort of change up our plans. Did you did you realize that in some ways you were in <laughs> you were in the work of ministry with me? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that was something I had to kind of understand. I think for a long time I was just kind of confused because mm-hmm. um, I think there was definitely a period when I like didn't even really know that you were the pastor of the church and like didn't really know what that meant <laughs> so <laughs> uh, and so i think once i did understand i think that it just sort of clicked sure because you know what's funny we have children's church at, at at fountain of life um if and if anyone's ever visiting madison wisconsin you need to stop by and see us at fountain of life on sunday mornings but because you were part of children's church you know your mom would check you in right at 10 o'clock Right. And so you never saw me on the stage. So you <laughs> probably did think we were just all going to, fa- you know, to church together. Mom took you downstairs. I kind of went wherever the grown ups went. So it wasn't really until, I don't know, you were older. Maybe there wasn't children's church that day and you had to sit in the sanctuary with the adults. And maybe you saw me on stage with a robe or preaching. But you're, you're right. For many of the years, I remember one day children's church was canceled. And um, you asked me who was, char- who was in charge of children's church because I guess you were going to demand <laughs> that they that they hold it. You got that, you got that from your, you got that from your your G grandmother. You got that from uh, you know. Let me see your boss. So you asked me. You said, Dad, who's in charge of the children's church? And I said, uh, Sister Fabu. And you said, Well, who's in charge of Sister Fabu? Going straight and to I the said, top. I am, huh? I was going straight. To you the were top. going straight to. You said, Well, who's in charge of Sister Fabu? I said, Well, I guess I am. You know, like at your school when Sister Kathleen is in charge of your school, I'm in charge of the church. I can just remember this weird look in your eyes, like. Like you're the principal, <laughs> the, you know, you're the principal of the church, like your sister Kathleen here. But I realized at that moment, you were like six or seven. You had no idea what I did for a living <laughs> and what six year old does. But you certainly did not know that I was in charge of the church. You just thought that's where we went every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that piece was really, was really, really acute. When, one of the things we did when you were little, because we wanted you to know how unusual your story was. I mean, when you came home from the hospital, uh, it made front page news. The TV stations came. Um, a radio station covered the story because I mean it was it was really key because you were one of the smallest babies ever born at that at St. Mary's Hospital, and um, and then you came home weighing almost almost six pounds. And so when you were a kid, we would make sure that our friend Cynthia would do a puppet show telling your story and she had this little song about Lexi was a pound and a half and grew to be really big and how important faith is. Um, I recently found some of those old videos where you got a chance to see yourself as a Mm one-year-old, two-year-old. By about the time you were three, I kind of remind you, I mean, I kind of remember you um, getting it. I could sort of see in your eyes as the puppets were singing about you that you kind of got, hey, this this is my story. That little mm-hmm. pup is talking about talking about me. But um, what was that like seeing videos of you at one or two sitting on our laps watching this little puppet show at your at your birthday party? It was it was um, it was I don't know what the word is. Uh, I think it was something I like you told me about, mm-hmm. and I had like some memory of, but sure. it was different to like actually watch it. Um, and I know especially the videos of like seeing you guys going to the hospital and like the day that you guys brought me home. Um, it's really different to like see you guys and how excited you clearly were. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's it's completely different to be able to actually like see that on your faces versus just being told sure, about it. Sure, sure. We, we sprung that on you for your 21st yeah. birthday, all those videos. Because it's one thing to see a picture of yourself as a kid, but to see the video is right. a whole nother thing. Um, 
I can remember that we sort of got dubbed as the party house in the community. <laughs> because when I was growing up, kids could come to our house. But mom, you know, your grandma was really particular about us spending the night over other people's homes. Because if she didn't know the parents and didn't know the family, you know, nope, you can't be standing over those people's house. And so your friends did over a lot. So, I mean, you had lots of parties. You had your friends over all the time. But I'm wondering, do you know that some of your friends, some of your white friends, because it would be like a cul-de-sac or, you know, Charleston Drive party. And, you know, you're the only African-American girl Mm -hmm. on the street. We're we're the only black family on the street. But do you know that some of your friends would call me dad outside of the parties and outside the house? Did you know that? No. Oh, my God. And they would call me dad in front of their white fathers. (laughs) So do you know, Lexi, that you almost got me killed a couple of times? I can remember one time um, and one of your friends. you know, her, their parents were separated or divorced mm-hmm. and her dad was coming to pick her up. You mm-hmm. know, so her she did not live with her dad. Right. So she was in the car with her dad. He was going like, you know, towards the stop sign. I was going towards Richardson. Mm-hmm. And the window was down. She yelled right across her dad. She said, hey, dad, how are you doing? <laughs> I was thinking, this child is about to get me shot up here um, in, in, in Fitchburg. So oh that, was, that was <laughs> Well, that was cute, though, yeah. because I, I, I think about for a lot of your friends, having cross-cultural relationships was becoming really was really normalized. Right. It's interesting to me um, how open kids are to things when it just seems normal to them when they're when they're right. exposed to it. But okay. she thought that it was nothing, right. <laughs> nothing weird about calling me dad <laughs> in her father's car sitting right next to him. <laughs> but uh, man, I whenever I yeah that but that was a very strange moment. <laughs> um, I want to just reflect back on some other things about about childhood that I thought were really good. I'm known now as a storyteller as part of my preaching and communication style, but you used to always make me tell you stories. And so it's interesting (laughs) that years later, I have a podcast, I've written a couple of books, but that you're a creative writing major, you write stories, you edit stories, you love stories. And so we sort of practice on each other. But do you you remember asking me to to tell you those stories? I remember you falling asleep in the middle of telling (laughs) them to me. (laughs) I was really trying to get Uh in character. I was really trying to to be a little bit more contemplative. Mm -hmm. But you're right, I would, I would would fall asleep. (laughs) I mean, those are some crazy days. I come home dead tired. And I was like, oh, good. I get to see Lexi before she goes to bed. I get to tell her story. And then I would just like start snoring right in the middle of the But the thing is you would like fall asleep like in the middle of your sentence. (laughs) So you'd be like, there is a princess in a cat. And then you just like I just fall asleep right there. Oh, (laughs) well, I want I just want to apologize for falling asleep. (laughs) Um, Did I have any reoccurring characters and stories that I told you? Do you remember do you remember any any characters or, or themes of stories in particular? Yeah, there was um, you I'm trying to think. You told a lot of stories about like, oh, what was it? It was like babysitter's superpowers. <laughs> I remember that yeah. babysitter superpower, and you were the main character. Yeah. So you were like six, but I would you know say like you were like a fifteen year old. And what yeah. would that what would that babysitter? What what was what was she? It do? was like they she could like teleport, <laughs> so she could like take the kids like wherever. Right, so like they would like she'd come over to babysit, and then there'd be a crisis someplace in the world, like Australia or right. or or, or a, you know a fire, a forest fire in Kenya, and she would just transport there. Right, and then they would put out fires, fight dragons, and then they would teleport right back to the bedroom as the parents are coming right. back home from right. dinner or from a movie, and these kids would just would just be dead asleep because they were so tired for just traveling around <laughs> the world. You need to write a book about that. That was actually one of my <laughs> one of my uh, best stories. That was that was uh, that was a lot of fun. I think it was during that time that I found out you could read <laughs> because I would you know we, you'd follow along while I read a story and I'd fall asleep again. And so I, I yeah <laughs> you're gonna get that when you get older because your great grandfather Homer did it and then your grandmother does it and <laughs> I did. It's like if I sit still I fall asleep and you, you you're like you've judged me your whole life, but you're gonna have children one day and you're gonna be talking or cooking or doing something. Don't or, put that on me. Yeah, and then just fall asleep. I don't um, want that. But but so. But I remember like I would stop and you would say the word and I thought you memorized the story. I didn't know that you were really reading the words, but like I would just stop and you would say dog or I'd say and then the yellow I kind of fall asleep and you would say cat. Um, no, no, that was cool. I know I, I um, no doubt those are cool times. Um, do you remember the time because uh, you hate to be teased? You still do. You never yeah. liked that as a kid. And that you got from me. I hate being teased. So it's really <laughs> it's sinful that I that I tease folks. <laughs> But um, do, but do you remember the meanest thing you ever said to me in my life? Like I've been said a lot of things. I've been told a lot of things. 
Um, I've been to the Deep South. I've been to Europe. I've been all over. I've been to KKK <laughs> rallies. But the meanest thing, and you weren't trying to be, you weren't trying to be mean. But one day I was teasing you because you had no siblings, and you know we had told you the story about your two daughters who just didn't <laughs> live very long. And I said, um, "Ah, hi, Lexi. I have a sister, and you don't have any siblings." And you said, "Well, I would if you did. If you, <laughs> I would if you didn't kill them." And I said, "Oh, I said, oh, oh my God! Oh, I said, oh, who is this devil child? Somebody bring me some blessed oil!" I said, "Lexi, do you? Oh my gosh, do you think I killed your?" I said, "Jackie, come here. You do- bring the Bible. Your daughter, your daughter just accused me of murdering her sister. And you had such a." <laughs> <laughs> you had such a sad look in your eyes because you were just trying to be funny. You are trying to tease back. I just need you to know I went into daddy therapy after that. I just <laughs> want you to know I spent like $3,500 in therapy um, after that conversation. No, that was no. it was just because you, you, you were trying your chops at teasing. And so you didn't know how to tease. Uh, you knew how to wound. And uh, wow. You know, I mean, Lexi, that was pretty strong. All I could say is Drake needs to be glad that Pusha T came after him and not you. <laughs> Drake got off easy. Because you would have talked about the baby, the baby's mama, you know, how she was really, you know, yeah, anyway, I'll just stop from there. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. No, 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 Lexi. I knew you didn't mean any harm on that, but I just, I just thought. I wish I mean I'm rarely speechless. I'm rarely speechless. That just took the wind out of my I just went to bed. I went for I I started smoking that night. I mean that's how I just went and bought a pack of cools. Filterless, you know, and just stood under the street light, you know, smoking and you know, I I yo oh my gosh. And um I think I started listening to rap that night too. I think that's when, when I think that's when I went and found me some Lil Wayne. Oh, uh, no. Oh, oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Like I think what's 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 what was so cool um, is because I was so excited about being a father. Um, you know, I, I played jokes on you and messed with you all the time. So I want to thank you for being a good sport because I would do things to you like I would call you when I would be I don't know in California and say, "Hey, Lexi, guess where I am?" And you're like, "Where, Dad?" I'm like. I'm in the spoon drawer. So I could hear you in the kitchen opening, <laughs> opening drawers and cabinets. Like, where, Dad? I don't see you. Or sometimes Mom would be driving you to school. I said, Lexi, look out the window. Do you see that? Do you see that red car? You're like, yeah. Baby, that's me. And you're like, where, Dad? I don't see you. So I'm sorry for any psychological pain I caused you for making you think that your dad was hiding in the spoon drawer or riding around with all these other various families on Fish Hatchery. <laughs> Fish Hatchery Road. Oh, oh my goodness. You know, one of the things that um I think is 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 important about fatherhood is um at least this is what dads say when we're talking about things, particularly dads, is where those of us who are fathers of, of beautiful young daughters, is that we're hoping that our role helps to um offer some sense of, of security. Um um for, for African-American girls, we talk a lot about black men and their black sons, mm-hmm. but not a whole lot about black men and their, and their black daughters. And so I'm not thinking so much about our relationship, although this can certainly influence your your um, your answer a bit. But what do you see as some of the strengths um, when young women have fathers and or father figures in their lives in terms of self-esteem or understanding their own beauty or their own strength have you thought have you thought of that what, what, what role do you think strong father figures play in the lives of, of young black women yeah I think that that's really I think it's a really significant relationship especially when young women are learning how to interact with men in their lives mm-hmm. um, and I think that fathers have a really uh, really big impact on that um, I think like I think I know you said that our it's not necessarily about our relationship but I think that our relationship has taught me a lot about how I want to be treated Mm -hmm. um, and about like how I would want other people or like men in particular to interact with me. Um, And I don't know if I would have that same insight or that same like knowledge without our relationship being the way that it is. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a, 
that's a real important insight. Like there are things that dads would say, like we talk, we'd huddle up sometime and talk about things that we do, but like making sure we open the door and things that some of those things are just plain chivalrous, mm -hmm. may not be as important in your generation, but just things to, because we want to convey you're beautiful, you're worth being treated well. And so how do we do that? How do we convey that to you other than doing those kinds of things for you? But, I, but I'm also sure, I'm sure that you've, you know, Felt a little pressure in that too, because we're like, look, you're gonna have a job, you're gonna have your own money, you're not gonna <laughs> let anybody try to entice you for stuff. You're gonna have your own car, you're gonna have your own stuff, <laughs> uh, so no one can come and tell you all these things that they're go that they're going to do. Um, but I, I but I love that that insight because that's what we as dads are hoping that that we're conveying by just um, showing that level of love and that and that level of of respect um, and. And that's why I think fathering and mentoring is really so so important because I think that they're fathers, but they're also they're also father figures. Um, do you? I'm, I'm just curious. Do you do you hear friends who are being raised in arenas where they're strong fathers or fathering figures talking about the benefits yeah, of that or what it means in their lives? Definitely. Um, I think. Yeah, I think that especially with my friends that are also close with their dads, I think that um, they like. I definitely. Um, in situations where we talk about it um, and how it's also significant for them. Mm. And like, I think that they have similar opinions and like, they, like, I feel like they feel the same way that I do sure. about how significant that relationship is for them. Sure. And you know, then you've, you've been raised around strong black women who've not had fathers. I mean, your mom right. didn't grow up with her father, your aunt Laleda didn't grow up with her father. So you know that there are strong women um, because they've had, father figures, aunts sure. and uh, uncles and, and, and uh, older brothers and cousins and things like that. For sure. But do you think it helps you to see through games? Like when men are coming up trying to say what, whatever, whatever they always call it, like macking or, you know, <laughs> rapping or whatever it's called, you know, these have changed over the decades. But like when a guy is coming and just trying to just talk foolishness, um, do you think you're able to spot game and emptiness and hollowness? Um, you know, when, when guys are way off and they think that they're on, do you think, you think you pick up on that because you've seen what's strong? Fathering figures are like definitely. Are you able to put them in their place? Definitely. Okay, my job here is done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what's important in our community too is that not only do you have me as a dad, but like Big John is a cousin, and then you have this slew of you know uncles, real and 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 made up, right? And made up like as a kid, you probably didn't even know who was your real blood uncle and who wasn't because <laughs> these are all uncle figures, right? But also, I want to stress that just having fathering and father figures, um, I think it just pro has just provided something really strong for young people, particularly young women, mm -hmm. um, in a world and society where where there's a lot of pressure to objectify women um, yeah. and to try to affirm um, their beauty in a manipulative way right. so that they're used for, for men's purposes. And so one mm -hmm. of the greatest hopes that dads have who are hanging around and being in their daughter's lives is that they'll have the strength to tell somebody to step off when they know, when they know that they're not coming at them. Yeah. Right. And you know, and then also some martial arts lessons and some, <laughs> some and some and some mace spray. Um, now you and I have talked about this a whole lot, where uh, you're sensitive to gender roles, and so so you don't yeah. you know so like you know dads don't have to do the bills, moms don't have to do all the cooking, and right. you know all this. So I know you you've been schooling me on this. <laughs> yeah, we should have kept you in private school for college. And um, so I know you so I know you're sensitive to the overuse of some of the gender roles. Um, but are but are there other key things that you think fathers provide or um, become or help or share that's 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 crucial for the development of um, of a young of a young lady? Um, I like that you use the word security, and I don't think that, that necessarily has to be a physical thing. Mm -hmm. um, like Tell I me think, more about that. I like like I think emotional security is also a very real, very important thing. Um, I think it revol like it involves a lot of openness and like you have to have a healthy relationship I think to be able to have that kind of like intimacy mm -hmm. um because like it's it's I think it's really easy to bottle things up and to like sure. not share them but I think like I know you and I are like always talking about like what's going on or like what has me stressed out or like um things like that and I think that that's um I think that that's really important I think I don't I don't know if that's like the first thing somebody would think of when somebody said security but I think that that's a very valid form of security. No, that's 
No, that's very that's that's real insightful, and it it actually caused me to think about some things differently. Like when you were younger, you did not think that it was weird to talk to me and your mom openly about life stuff. Like mm -hmm. I can remember you just saying to us one day, "So where do babies come from?" <laughs> And it wasn't like I've got a question for mom, dad, can you can you leave the room? Right. But, you know, because as dads, we would say, how are we going to handle this when our daughters ask us these questions? What are you <laughs> going to do when a guy comes over to the house? Or what are you going to say when this stuff starts going on? And so it's just it's very interesting to me that there are certain levels of discussion just about life or life's changes, life's changes. And you didn't seem freaked out to talk about that mm -hmm. in front of me while I was while I was sitting there. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to leave the room sometimes. I was thinking, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I don't want to have this conversation. But then I also thought, you know, if this discussion is not strange to my daughter, I'm never going to let it be strange to me. Yeah. And so because if you're comfortable expressing how you're feeling, and talking about life and you're young and so some of the changes that are, that young people go through through you know through you know puberty into adolescence those discussions weren't they didn't weird you out mm -hmm. and i think about that when you talk about a sense of security because yeah. i think if you're able to for young ladies able anyone but we're talking about daddy daughter relationships um, if you're able to feel very comfortable talking about all aspects of life and relationship that can't be anything but healthy i would right. think um, one of the things that I think your generation suffers from, um, particularly those of us, like for my generation who remembers poverty and welfare and things like that, and we want to give our children this kind of lifestyle, that when you do experience stress, we think, oh, well, I did something wrong. I mean, hmm. you know, I sent this kid to private elementary and middle <laughs> school and, you know, put her in track clubs and soccer clubs. She's not supposed to be stressed. She's not mm -hmm. supposed to have um, anxiety. She's not supposed to be worrying about things. You know, we've got this all taken care of. And so sometimes you have to worry about my stress over your stress. <laughs> and, and you've helped me to sort of step back and understand that it's, it's not my responsibility to try to fix all of those things in your world. It's just mm -hmm. sometimes just growing up young in this, crazy world that's never unplugged and hands are never freed from technology um, that as parents who have invested so much in our children um, we can't be helicopter parents or feel responsible for all of your um, emotions and mm. so so you've helped me to understand the importance of just stepping back and just saying this is just a part of growing up and being a young person mm -hmm. in America doesn't mean that you didn't move me to the right neighborhood or send me to the right school this right. is just life right now let me have my moment of stress <laughs> And I'm learning to let you have that without feeling like I got to come in and fix things. Yeah. And so um, have I tried to fix stuff a lot? Have I done that a lot? Well, you I can think... be honest on here because <laughs> I'm going to edit all the bad stuff out. Anyway. <laughs> um, well, I think you and I are very similar in that we. Um, I think. Oh, what did you call it? You called it Jack Syndrome from from Lost. Oh, yes. One but, of our uh, favorite. One of our favorite series. But um, he. We call it that because he tries to fix everybody. He tries to save everything, even the people who like can't make it. Right. Um, and I think you and I are very similar in that we really try to um, like protect everybody else or like help everybody else. And like sometimes, I know I've had to learn, especially with anxiety, that sometimes you can't fix it. Sometimes you just kind of have to like wait it out. Um, and so I don't. I don't think I would say that you tried. Like it's not. It's not like you don't let me have those moments of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it's bad that you want to fix it because it makes sense why you would want to. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but I don't like I don't think it's abnormal that you would want to do that. OK. Because okay. I want to do it. <laughs> sure. No, I got you. Um, you know, I just got we're having all the, we're going down memory, memory lane. That's in my generation. That's what it means when you're having flashbacks. <laughs> and um, but I, I I'm thinking about your friends used to come over for sleepovers. I'm going back to the childhood for just a moment. Mm -hmm. I remember one night in particular, uh, I think it might have been for your 16th birthday. I'm not sure. It was kind of a major one because there's a lot of young ladies there. Mm -hmm. And they were putting questions in a fishbowl and okay. they're asking your mom questions, mm -hmm. which I thought was cool because, you know, I thought, OK, Kids don't want to be around adults. They want to, you know, it's a, you know, it's a birthday party, it's a sleepover. You guys want to talk about boys or watch movies or talk about what you're going to do when you move out of our homes. And at one point, remember your friends called me and like, Mr. G, come in, come in. We want a boy's perspective. Yeah. And those young ladies sat there and asked me questions for an hour about yeah. boys and dating and well, what does it mean when a boy does this? Or right. and then they started. I was blown away that um, that young people really wanted 
parental advice or involvement. Again, I wasn't telling them what to do, Mm -hmm. but they specifically said, we want you to give us a boy's perspective on some things. And they drilled me for an hour. (laughs) Do you you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Were you shocked that your friends wanted to talk to parents? Because I bet you their parents would have been shocked to think that they really had questions for adults, particularly for father figures that they had never that they never asked. Um, I think I wasn't. I wasn't. I I think um, I think what's really I mean, it didn't surprise me because people have always been really comfortable at our house and like with our family. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think it surprised me that they were comfortable having you in that space. But I think I was surprised that they wanted your point of view that much and to the point that they like asked you questions for a, a long time. And it wasn't like I have a friend who's dating a guy. Right. They were saying, okay, this guy says he likes me, but I was like, nope, nope, that's a jerk. <laughs> you know what he wants. Stop playing games. <laughs> Shut the door on that. Block him right now on, on you know, Instagram wasn't out back then. If it was, you didn't tell me. Um, <laughs> but, but that hunger for that involvement. Yeah. That still surprises me how open they were, but like mm-hmm. for a straight hour. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, they stopped asking your mom some of the questions because they had her for like the first half hour, 45 minutes. Right. But I think that just plays into the importance um, that as adults or parent figures, parents, we can give kids so much space and thinking, well, they want to have space. They don't need mm-hmm. adults in the, in the space. And you guys know how to tell us, you know, hey, we've had enough. Or you know how to transition from the living room downstairs. Yeah. We know that was a kid area. So, you know, we couldn't come down there. <laughs> but um, it just it just reminds me of the openness um, for, for fathering and that voice for so many young ladies to understand their value, their beauty, their worth. And these are questions they've been thinking about for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it was influencing their relationships. Mm-hmm. Can I shift gears for just, just a little bit as we move sure. into sort of the last segment of this? Um, you and I went to see um, um, Black Panther like, what, three or four times yeah. together. I love seeing that with you because it had been a long time since you and I were able to sit in a theater together and see storylines involving strong season black women um you know i don't think you've seen that kind of role modeling since you know the disney uh, princess and the frog the princess and the yeah. frog um so just tell me from when i was growing up do you think the role in the space of black women in media um has become more pronounced or do you think um it's well let me let me ask it this way um what do you feel about the role of black women in, in media right now? Let me ask you the question right now. Do you, do you think black women are getting the right kind of play, the right kind of roles? What's your, what's your view on the snapshot of, of how black women are portrayed in um, popular literature and um, in media? Um, I think a lot of black women, especially in movies, are very typecast. Mm-hmm. As, um, as what? Like I think that they, I think there's still a lot of like made roles um, where where it's like a even if it's not necessarily the same um, trope, they mm-hmm. act the same way. Like they'll either constantly be like, I don't know, like a like a a comic relief, or um, they'll play like like I said, like that maid role. Like I think that there's a lot of slots that mm-hmm. black women are expected to sure. fill. Um, and so I think something that I really loved about Black Panther was that not only are these like well rounded, um, like well developed characters that just happen to be black women like Mm -hmm. i think that that there's a difference between there being a well-written black female character and then like a well-written character that just happens to be a black woman Mm -hmm. um but i think also that they aren't significant in the story just because of their romantic relationships like they have their own character arcs that also connect to their romantic relationships but it doesn't center around that and i think that that's um kind of something that a lot of female characters in general get trapped in. Um, and so that was that was one thing that I really loved about that movie. And that, were you expecting to see that? I mean, the title being Black Panther, we knew that there was going to be a black lead, but were you expecting black women to be portrayed that way? Not like that. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I had high expectations, but I didn't expect them all to be met. And so when I saw the movie, I was completely blown away um, by... I mean, all of the characters were written really well, but I don't think I was surprised to see that in the men. Um, sure, sure. And the women were warriors. And right. So what do you think about that? Because I know 
Yeah, I I loved that. Yeah, I knew I, you did. <laughs> it's I mean it's it's awesome to not have women be damsels in distress. And I think one thing that I really loved about the movie is um, when T'Challa and Killmonger are fighting in like the last battle scene, um, and he like turns and sees that Killmonger is about to attack his sister mm-hmm. um, instead of attacking Nakia, his girlfriend. I thought that that was really interesting because I think um, romantic relationships are so prioritized in the media. Um, and familial relationships and platonic relationships as well are still really important. Like everybody needs those. Sure. But I think that um, that choice in that scene was, it felt really intentional. And I think it, it changed the story because I think it would have been really easy for them to just be like, oh, she needs him to save her mm-hmm. and like everything will be fine and they'll have right. like, they'll ride off into the sunset or whatever. But um, I think that there's a lot of reasons why Nakia is a really powerful character, but I think one of them is that she doesn't, she never needs to be saved in the entire movie. And and the women were such creative characters, like technologically, right. you know, advanced or doing, you know, s- special surgeries or yeah. rescuing, you know, one more broken white man or something. You know? <laughs> um, and so I know that that was very appealing because it just hasn't been a lot of that. Yeah. Um, um, for your, you know, for your, for you know, for for your consumption, right? Because we're in so many black women are in, are in other kinds of um, roles. You and I were part of a panel once, and uh, we had reviewed the movie. So I think the last time we saw it together, um, some of our allies, had, white allies, had come to see it, and they were having some talk back. Mm-hmm. But it was interesting. We were talking about the strength of some of the women warriors, and one of the questions had to do with hair. Like, well, what did you think? Like, what do you think about? You know, <laughs> the hair is like we have all these strong characters and someone wants to know about well, so what's going on with the with yeah. the with the ball thing? I mean <laughs> talk about that for a minute. I mean that was just missing all the strength as if somehow that should have been related to the strength yeah. or related to the beauty. What, what do you what do you think what do you think was behind that question? I think uh, I think it was kind of like I'm not used to seeing that. So what do you think about it? Oh, right. It was what do you think about her yeah. being bald? Right? right. Or like all having natural hair. Um, and I think it, it it definitely seemed kind of um, like not unrelated, but it kind of seemed like out of left field because we were, we were talking about like how their characters function and like how Nakia was the one who suggested that like Wakanda does work like helping like doing refugee work in the rest of the world and you and you corrected the person asking a question because they said they thought it was very good that the white male character made that suggestion yeah and you said well actually yeah nakia was the first one to suggest that and so i think that that question kind of caught me caught me off guard because it was it seemed so superficial mm-hmm. compared to the rest of the discussion like talking about women's roles and like how they how they're more than just like a like eye candy Mm -hmm. and then like this question about like their appearance their appearance it comes right right behind it so yeah i thought that was i did think that was pretty odd now it's 2018 and um you know for many folks your grandparents look at you and think you have access to things they never did from you know you know your grandmother and your mom's side was part of the um, civil rights marches that took place in Selma, Alabama. So seeing you being able to vote and finish college and do all the things you're doing, um, you know, your grandparents are very, very proud of you. Your parents are, of course, but your grandparents are very, very proud of you. But um, but still, as an educated black woman, there are still things that you've got to do, microaggressions you've got to still mm-hmm. deal with. And so although you have all of these um, abilities at your at your fingertip, there are days you have to still just cut through the the messiness of microaggressions and people asking you weird questions. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you how do you how do you keep yourself motivated and encouraged um, while still having to deal with some residual effects of segregationist thinking or or a racialized society? Mm-hmm. You know how do you deal with the dichotomy of you're young, you're black, you're brilliant, you're college educated but people still see you as a woman who's black and not necessarily sure that you should be on campus. Maybe you're there on a scholarship right. or, or on, a, on a handout or something like right. that. How do you balance that and not completely lose yourself or become totally frustrated? Um, I think it helps me to either spend time with my friends of color or spend time with um, 
with my white friends who either want to hear my because it's not that I I want to educate my white friends on what I'm experiencing, mm-hmm. but I think that if I don't talk about it, they won't necessarily be aware. And so sometimes I'll just rant and they won't necessarily try to fix anything, but they'll be like, okay, it's like I hear what you're saying. Um, but I try to spend a lot of time with my friends of color who experience something similar mm-hmm. um, and... Uh, I don't know. I think I think I didn't really I wasn't really aware of how bad microaggressions were until I got to campus. And I think it really helped me to have my um, scholarship group that was like Mm -hmm. mostly students of color um, to have that space where we could all kind of like dump all of this stuff where everybody's kind of experiencing something similar, kind of feeling like um, like people on campus didn't want them there or that like they needed to like somehow earn their place on campus as if they didn't deserve it and did you did you feel that regularly definitely for sure and i'm sure you didn't share that with us to the extent you really experienced it right but i'm just thinking your parents both have degrees from wisconsin your grandmother does like you and i've been keeping this tally we've got 13 degrees in our family from uw madison and you're still dealing with the microaggressions or people saying in classrooms I don't think it's fair that minority students are taking right. spaces away from white students, right. white qualified students, as if right. because you're there, you're not qualified. Not only are you a legacy student, you had an excellent GPA and good scores. Um, I can imagine that that is that that is bothersome, and the fact that you could press through that and um, and still perform well shows the strength of your resolve. But also, I appreciate the friends that that you that you have that you can talk about those yeah. things with. Was this is it, was it strange initially for your white friends to hear you? vent about some of those things were they oblivious to some of that um i don't know if they were oblivious but it definitely was something that if they were aware of they didn't really have to think about um and so i think for a long time i didn't talk about it because i was like oh everybody experiences this or like oh they're not going to care because like they don't get it um but i think the more that i talked about it the more my it kind of forced them to be like oh this is something that happens and it happens to somebody that like I care about and somebody I spend a lot of time with. And I, th- so I think that's, um, it's definitely changed my relationship with a lot of my white friends because it's, it's forced them not only to think about it, to like think about it in their own situations, but to be aware of it like in their own lives and when they're interacting with me and with their other friends of color. Yeah. That's, that's so important. Um, I've no, also noticed that with your cross-cultural, some of your cross-cultural friendships, I can remember as a young person, we would be the carpool or the chauffeurs to some of the big concerts. I remember you going to a certain concerts in Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. I won't name the artist, but you'd go to see, you'd go to see <laughs> folks. But if you wanted to go see, say, Beyonce or someone, right? You had friends who would say, white friends who would say, "I, I don't get, I don't get her music, yeah. or I don't." And I mean, that must have been very interesting because it's not like you necessarily understand Taylor Swift's world. I <laughs> uh, hope not. Um, but it's interesting how people just sort of backpedaled when right. the artist was... Because the assumption is if you're white, you're for everybody. Mm-hmm. But Beyonce is just for, just for black women. Right. That, that, that must have been interesting for you trying to navigate that or realizing, or trying to figure out why your friends didn't get that. Yeah. I think it's kind of funny that you say that about Beyonce because I think, I think people try to stretch her to be for everybody but I think that like her like and I mean I think that like I don't know like everybody enjoys Beyonce but I think mm-hmm. that there is a certain part of her that black people especially black women can really connect with in a way that I don't know that people of other cultures can necessarily understand to the same extent mm-hmm. um, but yeah I definitely did experience that I had a friend actually text me the other day saying like do you want to go see Beyonce with me in August and I was like I can't because we'll be out of town and she was like oh none of my other friends would want to see her with me and I was like it's Beyonce (laughs) what's wrong with you right 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 yeah they probably would have before that (laughs) halftime that halftime show wow that's that's interesting um how are you hoping that um the media will change um regarding black women do you do is your hope that more black women will write screenplays movies produce something i really think that the media needs to do for young black individuals is i think that all of the remakes Mm -hmm. that they're doing 
like I enjoy them, but I I think there's so many new things that young people, and especially young people of color, are making that need that airtime. Mm-hmm. And I think remakes are easy and make a lot of money, and so I think that those are just like convenient. Um, but I think that it's just taking space away from young uh, creative people who like have things that need to be heard and seen and read, and they're just not being given that space. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping that like behind the scenes media will leave more room for that. Um, and I think like in front of the camera, I think that there needs to be so much more diversity, not even just for black women, but just especially for women of color and just minority women in general. Um, I think, I think it's improving, but I think it's still not anywhere. Like I, I think about the success that Black Panther had with being um, a movie full of black people. And I think that other minority groups really need that. Like th- that representation is so significant, not even for people my age or older, but like mm-hmm. for kids, like kids really need to see themselves in these roles that show them that like they can be powerful and they can be independent and have their own opinions and their own thoughts. Um, and I think other kids of color need that as well. And like other minority kids really need that. So I think that there's a lot that the media still needs to do to um, create space for people that need to be seen and heard. I think that they're just not doing it yet. I think they're still staying with what's safe. Well, I hope that means that folks with degrees in creative writing like yourself might consider (laughs) screenplays or using some of the technology that's around to make indie movies and and music. And so um, not that you have to take that whole thing on yourself, but I, I think what your generation has shown us, what's happened in your generation is that like when I was growing up, there was no such thing as Uber or Netflix mm-hmm. or Hulu. And these folks are, you know, becoming, you know, world like Uber doesn't own cars, but yet it's this world power. And right. then you've got Netflix. Like who says who says Warner Brothers anymore? Who says <laughs> Paramount Studios? It's like Netflix is making movies. I thought it was weird when HBO made movies, but now these folks are making movies. People, these independent, formerly French voices are really taken to the waves and they're they're making a statement in the world. So Mm -hmm. I I hope you continue to think about ways in which you want to do that. Lastly, you're working on a writing project right now with one of your professors Mm -hmm. um, that grew out of, we don't have to go into all the details, but but she allows students to read some passages out of a book um, uh, where they're using the N-word and asked, well, if you don't feel comfortable saying it, you know, don't read the word, but didn't ask you, the only African-American woman in the class, right. that if you didn't, if you have a problem hearing it, right. say something. But you wrote to the professor and she responded, she apologized, recanted. But the department chair is coming as you and this, this, this professor to write something on, on what subject? Yeah. So we're writing it. We're basically writing up what happened and our like our thoughts and our questions on it for um, a journal on teaching failures. So, so your department chair wants, <laughs> is this punishment for that professor? <laughs> they want the professor to write about about teaching failures with the students she had failed. Now, I, was, I really respect both the department chair and the professor for, for yeah. being willing to do that. But, I mean, that's got to feel daunting because in some ways, don't you get to call that professor out? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bit scary, um, especially because I think even though she's not my professor anymore, like I'm no longer in her course, but I think I still view her as somebody who's, I mean, I guess she is still in a position of power that I don't have. And so that makes me feel kind of um, intimidated or like I feel like I shouldn't be writing about why that situation hurt me or why it made me feel the way mm-hmm. I felt because it's about her. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, But when I, I met with her on Monday and she mentioned to me that when she mentioned to the, when she men- mentioned the incident to the department chair, um, that he said that there were like two or three other classes who'd had I mean, like either a similar experience or had pretty much the exact same thing happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think even if it terrifies me and even if I don't think I can do it, I think I have to. Sure. Sure. Because that, that's an opportunity to exert some power. Right. And this is a scholarly journal, right? I mean, this isn't yeah. just like for a report on your campus or in right. the department. This isn't a handbook. Right. This is a national scholarly journal mm-hmm. that faculty members look at mm-hmm. to, for, for guidance for how to avoid similar situations. Right. 
that's that's very that's very interesting but you know it took a lot to speak up and and on one hand i regret that you've got to continue to face those situations but on the other hand as your dad i'm glad that you know how to do that that you stepped up you wrote to your professor and then you watched her response and you mm -hmm. you know in life you don't always get a chance to dictate how people respond mm -hmm. but there will never be a response to what you do there, uh, there will never be a response to what you want if you never state your mind right and 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 state your you know your desires and so that took a lot of guts to write a current professor who, had, who who's in charge of your grade right in a department where you're majoring yeah um, and then it winds up you plays out down the road that the department chair wants to make sure that you all capture that moment that it never happens again mm -hmm. but that others are able to learn from that so does that feel like pressure that you've got to still instruct the department or does it feel like it gives you a chance to really have voice in the situation? I think it feels like both. I think when it happened and you said, like, you need to email the professor, I think part of me just felt like I'm so tired of having to tell white people what's okay and what's not. Like, I think, I, I, like, I, I felt, especially with it being an educator, mm -hmm. and I felt like I came to this campus to, like, get an education and not educate anybody. Um, and so I think that it it does feel like pressure because I I, I don't have all the answers. Right. Um, but I think at the same time, it's definitely very empowering because even if I don't have all the answers, I think I have some of them. Sure. And I think that you have to start somewhere. That's a bold, bold um, thing to, to say and to have to do, but that's role of leadership and um, traditionally African-Americans who've been able to obtain degrees and have the kind of exposure that you have, we have this responsibility of giving back to others or to standing up against injustice. Mm -hmm. So all those very weighty, and I'm sorry, that you have to I'm sorry that you have to stand up under it. I'm proud that you can step up under it. And so that just makes me really proud. Well, Lexi, it looks like I'm, I'm about out of time on, on this podcast. Um, thank you for this Father's Day gift <laughs> um, because I know that this is not something that you really enjoy doing. I have to let you know that you, you have a very good voice. You sound very good. In fact, some days when I'm out of town, out of the country, I might ask you to sit in with me, <laughs> uh, sit in for me and interview some um, some guests. But um, thank you for, for not only helping me to talk about fathering, but just listening to you explain your answers and your feelings and your dreams and your hope for the world. Uh, it just helps people to understand why I am so proud of you um, as, your, as your dad. And, um, it's interesting, even though you're 21 now, you're you're legal, you're adult, although in black culture, you ain't grown until True. you're 30 and got kids True. and then you're getting kind of close. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we just sit around and say she ain't grown. She ain't, she ain't grown. <laughs> uh, but no, you are. You're, you're, you're an adult. But it's so it's interesting that you keep reminding me that even adult children, adult daughters still need their still need their fathers because there's still okay. questions about grad school in life and sometimes we just think our work is finished when our kids go off to college but if we build the relationships in the right kind of way we still need we still need each other and yeah. and the 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 tone of the relationship changes like i can't just tell you to go to your room or sit down and shut up or, <laughs> uh or those kinds of or, you know or threaten to do something to you i mean i can but you probably won't listen um but it's just it's important for parents it's important for fathers who are listening to know our children still need us that they still need our our affirmation mm -hmm. um and you know and our care and what's also beautiful is that when we've invested in our children, um, you, you're a reflection of what I hope to be and what I long to be as a father, but you also give some of those attributes back mm. to me so that you know when I'm not my full self, yeah. your dad, are you okay? And I'm like, it's not your job. You know, when I'm older and I'm in a diaper, then you can take care of me <laughs> in about 50 years from now, but right now I take care of you. You're like, no, no, that's not fair. No, no, I get to ask you those kinds of questions too. So I, so I appreciate you being who you are in my life and in our life. Um, and there are so many things that I do in this world, uh, right? I talked about some of it, some of it, and uh, before, and some of it I do okay, some of it I do really well, some of it I do not so well. But um, being a part of bringing you into this world with your mother is one of my best contributions in life. So I know that might feel like some pressure. It's not even mushy; it's just true. <laughs> and so I want you to know that every day uh, you warm my heart. Um, as your, as a baby, there was no aspect of fathering that was ever problematic for me. Even when you crapped all over my floor or threw up on my suit, um, or just burst into my office. You didn't care if I was talking to the mayor, the governor, whoever I had in there, you just run in. There's no aspect of your life or fathering that ever felt 
burdensome or problematic. And so I tell you each Father's Day, and I will continue to do that, Dad, what do you want? I keep telling you that you are my Father's Day gift and that my um, my space in the world shifted when you came into it, not just as a performer or community person, but I got to be a dad, which brought with it a whole lot of healing for me. And so I appreciate you sitting here in the studio with me and allowing me to um, to dote on you and tell you how proud I am of you. And so I want to say to the folks who are in the studio, I'm a blessed and a very lucky man. I'm sitting in the studio right now with the brilliant and the beautiful Lexi G. And um, this has been one uh, a very special episode of Black Like Me. And um, I hope that you will help me share this and send this message out because so many of our young girls need to know how beautiful and how cherished and how loved they are. And many of our fathers need to know that it's okay to say that and to think that and to be that. And no matter where we are in the spectrum of fatherhood, it's probably not too late to connect with or reconnect with our children. So do what you got to do because fathering is one of life's greatest pleasures and greatest gifts. Thank you all for listening in today. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. 